I don't think I've got the easy subject, what price. Um, but as I said on my paper, I'm not Mystic Make. Um, I may look like Mystic Make, but I'm not. And I don't think there's a single trader out there who can get a crystal ball out and tell you what price you're going to have. My background is 21 years as a grain trader. Um, I've shipped grain around the world for Louis Dreyfus. I've shipped grain out of the UK. Um, I've shipped grain into the UK. I was more of a logistics trader than um, an analytical trader, so don't ask me too much about wiggly graphs and what's going to happen next on them because that's not how it works. A lot of the business that I've traded has been purely balance sheet analysis, crop sizes, and trying to work out which market's going to supply which consumer next, whether that be Egypt, or whether that be the Saudi Arabians with the barley, or whether that just be the guy sitting in Rotterdam with an ethanol plant. So all of those people obviously have a place. Um, I always look at things as variables. I suppose that's the agricultural economics background in me line up all the variables and try and work out what the conclusion is. So, as I said on here, where to start. From a global point of view, it's a, it's a big old world. There's an awful lot of things to take in. Um, I think the most important thing is to take key elements. Don't worry about things that you can't change, because if you're worrying about them, I can assure you a farmer the other side of the world's worrying about them just as much. Look more, again, a bit closer to home, look at the EU level. A bit closer to home, UK as an island, and then obviously more importantly, where does your wheat go? Where does your canola go? Or where does it go? Legally, what are the market situations that you personally need to be aware of when you're thinking about what you're going to grow and what price you think you might get for it when you finish? So, you look at it from every angle, um, but you need to know the competition. And one of the things I would say about the competition is that you need to keep all the competition in perspective as well. So which countries are the important from a global point of view? You can all pick up the Farmers Weekly, you can all pick up a Reuters story, you can pick up a thousand and one ones from grain merchants that tell you about drought here, issues there, El Nino's. You know, what is important? You've got to know the basics know which stories you want to be reading and which ones are just filling up the pages. Um, you might as well go to the back pages and read the sport sometimes when you see some of the reports that are written on grain market. And then you need to understand co co commodity substitution. We'll touch on that in a minute. But which commodities can go down the neck of a cow just as easy as something else? You know, nobody wants to feed the most expensive ration in the world. <coughs> something can switch with something else. Um, then I put the reality behind the reports, you know, it's every single day, oh, it's the USDA, we can't trade today, we've got to wait to see what they say, oh, it's, you know, so-and-so is going to come out with a report, it's going to move the markets. You need to understand why it moves the markets, who's reading these reports and why they're reading these reports. And then barriers to trade. One thing that a lot of people forget about, they see these crop numbers, they get very excited, but what they actually forget from a global point of view is not everyone trades with each other. Not everyone wants a GM corn. Not everyone wants a cargo with a phytosanitary issue because it's got wheat seed in it that they don't want in their country. Every contract that is traded from an international point of view goes down to the minutiae of which wheat seed is in that cargo. So when you have to fill in your passport and you have to go through the onerous issues of claims or rejections, it's not necessarily someone having a bad day because at the end of the day it's going into a cargo or it's going into consumption where there's even more tighter legal requirements further down the line. Um, <coughs> and other barriers of trade, well, obviously from a political point of view, there's an awful lot of those out there. And what I put at the bottom is there is obviously make the most of what you've got. We'll get on to that in a minute, but let's crack on. I don't know whether any of you can see this, but I've got some sort of gadget here might help, might not. It's obviously not going healthy at the moment. Um, <laughs> what you've got there is very similar to the graph you saw earlier. You've got a list of four commodities with global cereal um, production in million metric tons. Now, I'm a great believer in not just taking one commodity on its own, going back to the substitution effects. So we've got wheat, barley, corn, and rice. Why have we got rice in there? Because an awful lot of people eat rice. 
people eat their daily loaves of bread, that's fine, but once you've eaten all your daily loaves of bread around the world, you've got wheat there to feed to livestock, which interacts with the corn, which interacts with the barley. And in some cases, obviously, rice gets fed as well. Now, what I wanted to highlight here was one of the major issues. And if you actually look at how much we lost year on year, we lost between those four commodities 75 million tons, sorry, actually 74.3 million tons if you take wheat, barley, corn and rice. That was the reason why we saw this year's commodity prices do well. <coughs> now, one of the interesting subject matters there is that corn takes up 40.61%. Might just jump down. This number here <coughs> of the world commodities. That's a big percentage. And that number's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the reason why that number's been getting bigger and bigger is mainly due to the ethanol consumption in the state. 10% of the US fuel is made of methanol, <coughs> which comes mainly from corn. Currently, with the market where it is, you've got about 20 plants idle. And that's 20 plants and about 112 in total because it doesn't make money to make ethanol out of corn if your location is wrong. They're paying too much for the product to start with, it goes out the window. That's why you see the corn line trending upwards. You see any wheat trends look pretty horizontal on the back of that. And you see any rice go up. And barley, unfortunately, a bit on the slippery slope to horizontal. But it was those losses, and you can have a look at the numbers that are in your, in your pack up, um, that obviously caused the major issue with the prices. Now, going forward, you've already got predictions for next year's crop size. People are already talking about another monstrous crop in, in, the, in the US. If the drought hadn't happened this year, the question to really ask is where would prices be today? And not only would prices probably still be around £140 level, but you'd also be getting an absolute pounding for every claim that you had. And it wouldn't be pretty. Fortunately, okay, unfortunately from a quality point of view, but fortunately this year we got a global increase in prices. So the kicking on the quality, okay, it's a bit of pill to swallow, but it could have been an awful lot worse because your flat price is high. I won't, won't bang on about those, but if you get a chance to have a look, you can see the percentage decrease against the five-year average. The only one that's also of interest is if you look at the corn number at the bottom there, right at the bottom, the 15.7. It's interesting to see on five-year average, corn was a smaller crop but it was 15.7% bigger than the five-year average last year. And that's the type of increase you're seeing on the local corn scenario every year. <coughs> so if you just uh, look at who the competition is, and I'm useless at times, so I'm gonna have to speed up a bit. Um, what I wanted to do here, I put the combined wheat and corn crops globally, just on a quick presentation for you, so you can see who the big swingers are. You've got the US number one, <coughs> combined wheat and corn crop, China, EU, <coughs> India. When you're reading all these reports, have a quick reference. Who are the big boys to look out for? So they've got an issue, what's it going to do? <coughs> so if you can look on the right hand side, you can see the percentages, just as a quick one. Um, the top three, um, what are we looking at? 47%, top three, US, China, and the EU, 27, producing the world's wheat and corn crop. It's not a huge number of us. Um, you then look at the key exporters, and guess what? Number, Two, three, and four weren't even anywhere in the top producing level. They were right at the bottom. As it says there, those three, Argentina, Brazil, and Australia, produce only 8.76% of the world crop, but they export 28.85%. Heads up, they're important countries to watch for. Any issues there without that exportable surplus? And that's why we all look at the Australians and say, what's going to happen? And that's why the South Americans are obviously so important. Argentina and Brazil are in their main because of their corn number rather than their wheat number. And then you look at the key importers from a competition point of view. Now I put those on there. Japan's the world's number one corn importer. Egypt's the world's number one wheat importer. That's combined corn and wheat you've got on there. They are the big important members out there. Now Japan, it's all done through a government tender system. Egypt, again, a government issue. It's not a free market. Those guys have got the money, then they'll come to the market. Japan, it, it's regulated, so you will see the consumers behind it, but it's still regulated by the government. 
EU27, major imports with corn. We do have some inelastic wheat demand that we always bring in, um, and obviously subject regulations. If you want to know what the real price of wheat and corn is, well, you always look at the South Korean market. If you've got wires being produced, that will tell you where the real swing factor is between wheat and corn and the substitution effect, and how much cheaper or more expensive corn is against wheat. So, going on to substitution, um, what you've got there is a May 13 Chicago corn and wheat spread. Don't worry too much about it, apart from it's a wiggly line. What I'm trying to tell you is that over the year, and that's a whole year you've got there, corn in the US at its peak traded at $60 a tonne discount a week. Today, <coughs> that same contract is trading parity, if not a slight premium, so corn more expensive than wheat. It will show you more than anything else. It will show you the direct substitution between wheat and corn what's going on. Okay? Everyone's still in? Hopefully. And that's when, if you, if you look at the way the, way the graph moved, when, the, when everyone started combining corn and realised that the corn crop wasn't there, you saw that bounce back. We have a quick one down, up here, almost back to parity. Then everyone said, oh, well then maybe it's not that bad. Maybe we'll come back here. And then it's peak. It got to a major discount again. Again to week people lost the, the focus. They said, well, there's enough corn out there. And then everyone said, well, we're not exporting it out of the US. So we've got even more. But what they didn't realize, they were still consuming it in ethanol plants. But what they also haven't realized is the lag effect. And now they've got the, the smallest cattle herd in 60 years in the US. Because of the drought. Obviously cattle, forage eaters over there, corn eaters, the, the DDGs out the back of the ethanol plants. They're just not there to eat it. So if they want to bring their cattle back online, that's another two-year life cycle. And that's December 2013, so December down the road. And what that's showing you is it's still about, corn is still 60 quid, or $60, sorry, $50-$60 under wheat. Now is that telling you that wheat's expensive or corn's cheap? Is that telling you the market still has a confidence there's going to be a big corn crop or a smaller wheat crop in the US? Probably a combination of both of those factors. But if you want a, something to watch, I suggest that's an eyeball to keep on. Um, so moving forward, reports and press stories, USDA report. I don't know how many of you have ever seen one of these USDA reports. It's about 50, 60 pages of diatribe usually. Um, but everyone looks at it. The funds look at it. The important thing about the funds is that they don't have people on the ground. <coughs> the thought of a physical commodity scares the pants off. They're happy to trade trends, they're happy to trade lines. They don't like physical commodity. And when it starts getting physical, they get scared. They need the next story. They need a quick, you know, $10 here, $5 there, $20, $30. If in doubt, they get out. And that's what happened at the moment on the old one. Had enough, don't know which way it's going to go. Physical way, Ooh, might get a truckload of that. What do I do with it? Once they start getting into the swing of it and can see something, they'll jump on the bandwagon. That's why those reports are important. Get a timetable of when the next report's out. And just be a bit savvy about when you're marketing and around it. Um, I've put on there price to drive the drill, uh, the drill globally. It's not just UK farmers who are seeing big global prices. Everyone is out there with monstrous prices. You know, there is no reason not to drill wall to wall corn in the US this coming season. Um, likewise Australia, likewise Argentina, likewise everywhere else in Europe. Rain will go in the ground. The US wheat of the US, the UK wheat crop is about 2% of the UK wheat crop. Okay? If the world can produce it, we've got to make up an awful lot for the shortfall in stocks at the moment, but the ability is there. Um, and that's one thing I would be very savvy about as well. Weather impact, understand the real stories behind the shopping lines <coughs> I've got on there. I've been covering um, for open field members on a weekly basis at the moment, drought indicators in the US. We can all look at them. We can all make pretty graphs, but you've got to know which ones to look out for, which bits are important. Do you worry about the weather in Nebraska, Kansas? Where do you look? Where's the focus? 
know the actual issues. If it's dry as a bone over there, does it really matter if you're looking at the right state or the wrong state? If the world's put corn down, they'll manage to get it to grow somewhere. They may have a disaster in some of the other states as well. And political statements, we certainly read the thing about the Russians, the Ukrainians, ban, no ban, imports, no imports. Again, it needs to be kept in perspective and you need to know the full story behind it rather than worry about it unnecessarily. So, another set of numbers for you. Um, the USDA comes out with their global production forecast for next year, the harvest coming up in May. May last year, they produced a set of numbers um, there. You've got last Friday's February numbers there. You haven't got any presentation because they came out on Friday and it wasn't that quick. But what happened between May and October last year was the world, the USDA numbers in total on grains, we lost 138.95 million tonnes globally. From the initial production estimate to the October production numbers. That is why you saw the grain markets go skyrocketing. But by Friday, it was only 121 million. So we found a bit more grain. We found a bit more corn. But that worst case scenario in October, combination of the drought and everything else, was the reason your prices did what they did. Now I put the UK number under there as well, to keep everything in perspective, and I put you an EU number under there. The EU actually had a pretty good year, regardless <coughs> of the UK, but it was the corn crop that let us down in the end, uh, mainly due to the drought reasons down in Bulgaria and Romania. So let me go on to barriers to trade that was discussed. Genetically modified corn, always a good key subject to get people going. Um, it's always a, a major issue. Consumers, what they will eat and what they won't eat. You know, genetically modified corn is actually grown. If you buy corn out of Poland, it's got genetically modified organisms in it. So if you've got genetically modified organisms in Poland, that's part of the EU. They're EU approved events, but it is genetically modified corn. The only place you can buy non-genetically modified corn at the moment is probably France. Big premium, big price. So the world sees it, you either eat it at a nice price, or you avoid it like the plague and pay a big premium for it. Um, quality of crops, I mentioned earlier that weed seeds, <coughs> exciting issues like that. Everywhere you trade globally, there is an issue with quality. It's like the Egyptians, they'll only buy certain quality. If you haven't got it, don't worry about it. Can't do the tender, you're not on the list. Um, EU legislation. We've got a lot of EU legislation, it doesn't cover horse too well, but it does do maximum residue levels in wheat, so we can all have to sort of splat around for those. We then have tariff rate quotas, import restrictions, um, sustainability will become the key issue when it comes to bioethanol and into your rapeseed. You need to be on, on the ball of those because Anybody who knows their greenhouse gas emissions and their nuts two regions for their canola or rapeseed next year, as the years go forward, that's where you start making a premium for some of these products. Client risk, I've stuck that on there. Nobody likes trading with anyone these days. It's not just the banks say they've got money. Client risk globally is a big issue. If you're putting a load of grain on a ship somewhere or you're importing it, it's a lot of money. What is um, millers who have been buying grain, they've suddenly got a completely different um, financial flow of money than they previously had. It's cash against documents when it comes to a ship. It's not 60 days, 40 days, whatever they can get away with. So all of a sudden they need extra cash. Everyone is going to be needing extra cash. Logistics, constraints and costs, again, ships, trucks, trains, all of those have an issue, they all become a barrier to trade if you don't have the right size support for the economics of scale. And I've put biofuels mandates on there. Without the biofuels mandates, would we be getting through so much corn in the US? Would we be worried about ethanol plants up the road? Um, if the government wants to change things, that's where it comes in. So, what I've said here is make the most of what you've got. There's a big nasty world out there with a lot of nasty things going on. But looking forward, the UK crop is 
coming season. I'm not going to sit here and tell you we've got 80% in the ground for all your winter wheat. I'm not going to tell you what planted area we've got in for spring barley because you know something? You guys don't know, so I haven't a clue either. Because you haven't even put most of it in there. Um, have a damn good guess. But if the wheat crop comes out at 11 million, 12 million, or 13 million, it doesn't matter. We're still going to be a net importer into the UK. The key for you guys is to take what you've got and value what you've got. If you've got a smaller crop, segregate it by variety. Look after it, love it, but don't sit on it thinking it's going to be gold nuggets. Because as a net importer, the price you guys get will be the price of the next ship in the port for the same quality. And that is the key issue in knowing where the competition comes from. Because the consumers have had a taste for it this year, and you ain't going to stop them next year. They're going to want to be secure. Um, so, <coughs> the domestic consumers should want UK grains and a choice because they should be marginally cheaper than the next imported cargo. If they get any expensive, forget it. They'll go for the import. So, from a UK farmer's point of view, you've got to have, well, you're going to have a very good domestic market to feed. Um, and because of that, you should be taking advantage of it. But we need to say, we need to keep it competitive to keep the imports out and the exports to a minimum. Volatility is going to be here to stay, whatever happens, domestically and internationally. And as I said, segregate your crop as much as possible. That's a picture of a continuation um, knob wheat future. Seeing the highs, you've seen the lows. That is volatility. That is the roller coaster of the wheat market. <coughs> it's not going to go away. Um, and as I've said there, if you're marketing grain yourself, don't take your eye off the ball. And finally, Openfield members saw this last week because I had to publish it before I published it to you guys just for good order's sake. There's a Reuters poll that was done just after Christmas. And all the big important companies globally were asked what price December wheat in Chicago for December 13 next year, or this year, sorry. And they gave a price. And by the time you correlate all the issues that I can think of, i.e. a UK crop similar or smaller than this year's crop. The UK trading at parity to Matty, with a bit of currency in there, the wheat corn spread, and all the other variables I could possibly think of thrown in for good measure. I came out with a price close to 165 quid. Now, don't sue me. <coughs> don't quote me. But what I would say to you as a take-home message if you get to Christmas next year and somebody phones you up and says it's 165 quid, how would you feel about it? Bearing in mind today it's somewhat close, and that's a futures price. Bearing in mind today it's closer to 185. I think that's the question I'll leave you with. And if it goes to 200, fine. You know, I can't predict that, so I'll never say I can. But what I would say is that in a world where there is only a finite amount of capital to feed the world, I would be a, an advocate of 165 or unfortunately less than I would 200 plus.